Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone, to this Publish Right UK webinar on the future of extraction. So my name is Elisa Peter. I'm the Executive Director of the Publish Right UK International Secretariat. Uh, to my right is Duncan Edwards, the Director of Global Initiatives and Impact at the Publish Right UK Secretariat. And to my left is the comms team. Uh, we'd like to thank very much for the organization of this webinar. So Alexandra Malmqvist and Isabella Kima. Um, and then there's about 21 of you out there joining this webinar. Thank you very much for making the time. Um, you're all published with UPE members. So it's, it's a webinar for our members to discuss a key question related to the future of extraction and, and the challenges and opportunities associated with the exploitation of oil, gas and minerals. Um, we're having this conversation in the context of Publish Right UPE's ongoing reflection um, around our purpose and our goals in the context of our strategic uh, planning process. Um, to define our direction of travel for the coming five years. And as we're discussing um, our goals and purpose and unique value, we are asking ourselves a number of questions. Um, the first one is, are we advocating for the right policies, um, so transparency and good governance policies, um, are those the right asks? to improve people's lives in resource-rich countries, um, especially those people who are most affected by extractive projects. Um, are we planning ahead enough for the coming few years when the global energy landscape is going to be vastly different than it is today? And should natural resources be extracted at all? Um, and when extraction occurs, and under what conditions uh, should this happen? So Publish Right UPE members around the world will have different answers to these questions, and that's all right. Um, Publish Right UPE members uh, operate in vastly different national contexts, and will have different approaches, different strategies um, around extraction. But as a global movement, Publish Right UPE also needs to be able to better articulate um, how we prepare for the day when some resources, whether it's oil, gas, or minerals, can no longer be profitably extracted. Um, we also need to reflect on our global call for transparency in the extractive sector and the extent to which it may be supporting a decision to extract, even when other factors aren't met, such as benefit sharing with local communities or respect for community rights, uh, violation of environmental laws and so on. So this webinar is very much an opportunity to explore some of those questions together. Um, and it will be recorded in case you or others want to listen to it afterwards. So we will send you the link of the recording. So th to kick off the conversation, um, I would like to introduce Darmit O'Sullivan who is the author of a paper on the future of extraction, which is available on the Publish Right UPA website. And I very much hope that uh, some of you or many of you have had a chance to read the paper because it will very much kind of provide the basis of our conversation today. And we've also asked four Publish Right UPA members to prepare uh, comments and questions and reactions to Darmit's paper. And so that's Rahul Basu uh, from the Goa Foundation in India, who recently joined Publish Right UPE as a, as a member organization. And Diana Casey, the executive director of Logi in Lebanon. Oliena Pavlenko um, from Publish Right UPE Ukraine. And Matualo Masuni uh, from Publish Right UPE in Zambia. So we've asked those four people to prepare some comments and reactions, so we'll kick off the conversation with them. Um, just before I pass on the floor to Darmit, I just wanted to remind you of a few ground rules on how we're going to um, um, ensure this conversation is, is truly a conversation rather than a, a series of presentations. So 
uh, I'll ask all of you to make concise interventions and, and um, precise questions uh, for, for each other. Um, all lines will be muted throughout, um, and I would like you to please keep your mic and your camera off unless you are speaking. Uh, that's for the participants. For the four respondents and Darmid, you can keep your camera on. The webinar will be for either an hour or up to an hour and a half, depending on how the conversation go. Um, we have the line for up to 90 minutes, so we can stay and, and discuss together for, for up to, to 90 minutes if we want. Uh, in terms of questions, so we very much hope that all of you who are connected will ask questions. We will take questions in writing that rather than orally, so please use the chat box that's on the right-hand side menu of your screen, and we will be monitoring the chat box for questions so that we can put those questions um, forward to the, to the uh, speakers. And then finally, if you're having any issues hearing, uh, please indicate so again in the chat box so we can try to fix the, the technical problem. So that's about it for the, the grand rules. Um, I will now turn to Darmit O'Sullivan to give us a few initial reflections and questions related to the future of extraction. So Darmit, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Elisa, and uh, thanks very much for inviting me to, to, to talk to you. Um, just to check, everyone can hear me clearly, right? Good, okay. All right, um, I'm afraid I've, I've got some notes, so I'm going to spend a lot of this next few minutes looking down. So, uh, sorry about that in advance. Um, so, let me, um, let me start by briefly um, introducing myself. My name is uh, Dermot O'Sullivan, and my connection with Publish What You Pay is that I worked at Global Witness from um, 2003 to 2012. So I worked very closely with a lot of people from Publish What You Pay. I sat on the EITI board for three years. And uh, when I left uh, Global Witness, I spent a year as an Open Society Fellow writing a paper about the EITI, which is called What's the Point of Transparency? Um, so we could probably get a, a link to that later if you're, if you're interested. Um, now, I, I'm sitting very comfortably in my armchair, in, well, it's a sofa, actually, in London. I don't work on the ground with affected communities. I'm a London-based analyst. So the, the views that I'm going to give you now are quite theoretical and rather at the strategic level. Um, I'm not really going to give you a lot of answers, but I'm going to, to suggest some questions, um, which I hope will be useful for, for your thinking as, 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 as you plan your new strategy. Um, and I'm going to talk about the position of Publish What You Pay as an international coalition and its international messages. I'm very aware that it's a very big and very diverse coalition, and you do lots of different things on the ground. So please don't be offended if I say something and you think, yeah, well, we're, we know that. We're already doing that, because so, I'm trying to aim at the, the, the broad international level. Now, I'm going to talk about, uh, about, uh, about two issues today, which I think are linked. Um, one is the decision to extract. And the other one is the future of extraction. What does, what does extraction mean in the long term? Uh, and the first question, which you'll see from the paper, is really, um, should all the oil, gas, and minerals from a country be extracted? Without question. If not, then what should be the criteria that are used to decide whether this or that project should go ahead? And the second question is, uh, what does Publish What You Pay think governments should be doing now? to prepare for a future which may have less or no extraction in it. It may have no extraction in it because resources are finite and will one day run out, but also because, as Elisa mentioned, the, 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 the energy picture globally is changing, will change very substantially in the next generation uh, because of climate change. So if global action against climate change is effective, then it follows logically that there is going to be less demand for oil, gas, and coal. That there are other things you can do with these, but the demand is is presumably going to fall. So what does that mean for countries which are currently planning their development on the basis of, of, of hydrocarbons? Uh, and what I think links these two themes together is, 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 is a question of the future. Um, publish what you pay, it seems to me, really, for a long time, was playing catch-up. 
the, 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 the companies would extract, the governments would collect the revenue and then publish what you pay as an international coalition would go in afterwards and try and find out what had happened to the money. Uh, and I think um, it feels to me sometimes as if publish what you pay as a movement has lagged behind a little bit some of the global conversations about development and resources that you can see, for instance, in the, uh, the sustainable development goals. So I think it's, it's it, what, what links both these questions is the question of the future, what, what's meant to happen next. Um, now, Publish What You Pay has a position on the decision to extract, which is the first thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, and that position is in the chain to change. It's actually the, uh, the third point of the chain to change. And it says that there should be transparent impact assessments so that um, communities are informed of the, the costs and benefits of an extractive project that they can make, give their informed consent. Um, I think that that current position is probably something that you need to look at again, because I, I think it's quite problematic for a couple of reasons. Imagine, uh, let's imagine for the sake of argument, we're talking about a mining deposit, which is onshore. And let's imagine that it's in an area where there is a community living, there's probably uh, um, rivers flowing through it, there may be forests or farmland as well. and the community is going to be asked its view. But if you wait until the, uh, the point of the impact assessment, it may actually be too late because that's already quite late in the process. The government has drawn up the policy. It's started to make forecasts about what the revenue might be. The company is very determined to extract. And I think you probably a lot of you have firsthand experience of this. There's a huge amount of pressure to go ahead. And um, the community itself, of course, may be divided. There may be people who expect to get jobs or benefits and other people who are rather worried about extraction. Uh, and in practice, the decision to extract often seems to be a decision about how to mitigate the effects of extraction, which the government has already decided in practice should go ahead. So that's the first problem, is a timing problem. The community may not be asked until it's too late. The, the, the other problem with, with the approach in the chain for change is that impact assessments are necessarily imperfect. You can estimate you know, how big a deposit might be, and you can forecast what you think it might be worth in the future. But those, those things are, are very difficult to determine accurately in advance. The cost of extracting the mineral might turn out to be higher than you expect. Uh, the market price 10 years from now might be very different. And so with the social impacts as well, that what the local community needs and, and wants now may be very different once the mine has been in place for a while. Uh, and to give you an example um, of a, a, a mine I once visited in, um, in Papua in Indonesia, the Freeport mine, which is quite a famous copper and gold mine, well, a notorious copper and gold mine. And when the company first went there in the 1960s, um, there were a few thousand people living in the area. Now there's more than 100,000 because obviously what's happened in the meantime is that people have moved in. There's, a, there's all sorts of activity. So the whole question of who is the local community, what do they want, who is entitled to speak for them has become very, very complicated. So all that kind of stuff is in the future and it's, it's not knowable with any kind of exactness at the point when this decision is made. So the impact assessment is, is, is probably not the right place to take a stand on whether or not to extract. Um, the, um, the, the, the communities, in effect, are being asked to take a decision on imperfect information very late in the, in the process when politically it may be very difficult to stop. So it seems to me that maybe what publish what you pay could consider doing instead is to take a stance and principle on when extraction is and isn't okay. Now, every country is different, every country has different needs. And so it may not be that every national coalition agrees on exactly the same principles, but I think there are probably some, some principles that you could share at an international level. And I suggested a couple in the paper. One is ethic. And then the transparency question comes in. Well, how do we know that the free prior and informed consent has been obtained from the community? Uh, and then in other cases, there may be more specific national uh, principles which national coalitions could apply. And I think it's okay to have a set of international positions and then a set of national positions which may differ from slightly from one country to another. Because I think the common theme is transparency. Do people know what's going on? Do they know what's involved? Are they allowed to participate meaningfully in the decision? Is the government being held to account for making that process a meaningful one?
So that's the question of the decision to extract. And I think if you if you don't have a position on the decision to extract, the danger is in in effect you're saying, well, you know, extraction is, is okay. Our job is to come in afterwards. Because what you've got at the moment I don't think is really strong enough to, to, to really really push the debate at the international level anyway. Um, so if you if you could decide as a coalition that you don't want to go further into this issue, but in practice that may be a default position in favour of extraction. And I think given all the pressures that we have on natural resources, the competing pressures on land, water, forests, I think it's 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 going to get harder to not have a position which looks fundamentally at when it is and isn't okay to extract because of all the trade-offs that are involved. So the second point that I want to talk about is the future of extraction. And this, this would apply irrespective of what, what your position is on the first point. Um, the resources are finite. It's, a, it's, a, it's worth a certain amount, and when it's gone, it's gone. Um, it needs to be, if it's going to be extracted, it needs to be invested in something which is going to produce lasting value for society, which is going to make people's lives better. Uh, and the resource will one day run out. An example I didn't put in the short version of the paper, but which is quite interesting, is that um, Natural Resource Governance Institute did a, a, an analysis a few years ago where they compared the UK and Norway and natural gas. Between the two countries is the North Sea, and under the North Sea is a lot of oil and gas. And they compared the way that the UK extracted its share of oil and gas with the way that Norway did it. We, we spent ours. We, 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 um, I was going to use a rude expression. We, we, we threw ours away on tax cuts. The Norwegians saved theirs, and they were much more careful about how they extracted. So they've got a trillion dollar wealth fund, one of the biggest uh, sovereign wealth funds in the world, and, and we haven't. And our oil and gas is running out and other companies are coming for tax breaks. So that's an interesting example of two governments with very similar resource taking very different decisions on how to extract it. And one of them, I think, was very much better than the other one. Uh, so what are governments doing now to plan for the future, when there may, may be less extraction or no extraction. For some countries, that may be decades away. For some other countries, it might be quite soon, depending on how big the resource is. Now, governments usually do have national development strategies. Um, they're usually quite broad and quite aspirational. Um, and I think it's there is a value added for publish what you pay to say, well, right, how do we how, how do we take a position on what the government is doing now? We may not want to take a detailed view on every aspect of a national development strategy. But uh, because it differs from country to country, but we might want to say, how has this strategy been arrived at? Is it transparent? Has it been participatory? Is it consistent with the government's international commitments? So, for example, if the government has signed up to to uh, a, a target under the Sustainable Development Goals that requires them to, let's make up an example, to to, to protect forests, and they're issuing mining licenses in the middle of forests, then there's an inconsistency an inconsistency with that. So, I think. There are there is space for publish what you pay to take a view, which is transparency and accountability based on what the government is planning to do with the resource. Um, that could take different forms in practice. Again, I've suggested um, maybe at the global level you could just everybody could ask themselves the question: What do we think about what the government is planning currently planning to do with the resource? What that means in different countries, again, you can have a range of positions, whether it's an emphasis on saving the money or on spending the money on particular things like health and education, or just simply, um, if political conditions don't allow for a very ambitious position on this, simply to say, well, we want the government to report on how it is implementing this development strategy in a, in a sustainable way. Um, so those are two, 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 two areas I think it's important for the coalition to consider. Uh, and just to sort of summarise, um, why, 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 why is it necessary to do this? You could just stick with your current approach of saying we want transparency. We we hope it will at some point turn into accountability. You're a little bit vague on what accountability for what, but generally, you know, good governance and not stealing and so on. But it 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 it's, it feels a little from from an outsider's perspective, perspective and a sympathetic outsider's perspective, it feels a little bit dated. The, the, the big themes of development in recent years have been uh, climate change is massive, tax justice, gender justice, I see that you're um, doing quite a lot to address now. Um, but, it, but it seems as if the publish what you pay is rhetoric on whether extraction should and shouldn't happen and what it should be for just feels a little bit dated. So I think, I think in order to remain relevant, it's good to talk about these things. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there and uh, thanks very much.
Great. Thank you very much, Dharmit, for um, this presentation of the paper. We've just shared the last page of, of the paper that you wrote uh, for our participants, and I just want to um, read again the main questions in front of us. Uh, so, should all the oil, gas, and minerals in the country be extracted? If not, then what criteria should be used to decide whether or not an extractive project should go ahead? And should publish what you pay have some uh, globally agreed uh, criteria among all its members to, to decide on those, on those criteria that would make an extractive project to, okay to go ahead? Um, and then the other set of questions is around the future of extraction and what should governments be doing to prepare for the day when hydrocarbon or mineral deposits are exhausted so that they're, they're no longer there or can no longer be profitably exploited, for instance, because of climate change related laws and, and regulations. Um, and then a, a third question, which is what you finished on, Darmi, then um, what further information needs to be disclosed by governments and companies so that constant citizens can hold them to account on those two questions? Um, so that's what we're going to focus on in the coming hour. And I'd like to kick off the conversation by giving the floor to Oliena from Dixie Group in Ukraine, part of Publish What You Pay Ukraine. So, Oliena, uh, Ukraine has, has large reserves of natural gas and coal, um, yet Ukraine is one of Europe's poorest nations. So, energy independence is a key policy priority for, for the government, uh, especially uh, energy independence from, from Russia, and new projects are underway in Ukraine to exploit oil, gas, and coal. So, in this context, if you could tell us what Publish What UP members in Ukraine do to ensure that these new projects, new extraction projects, how, they en how you can ensure that they add long-term value to the people of Ukraine. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for, for the floor to speak. Um, yes, you are right. Ukraine is uh, uh, rich on natural resources. Uh, let me talk. Let, let me just take an example of, of gas, if you don't mind. Uh, just a few, uh, just a few slides. Uh, just to sh sorry, please, to show actually that we have three basin basins where the large reserves are focused. But at the same time, you can see actually how um, how the production decreased since seven. Ukraine is actually the case. Did you see, yes, this picture? Sorry. Did you have a chance to see the picture? No, I think not. No, it's not sharing, Olena. I think you'll have to describe oh. it. It worked. Okay, I will. Let's do. So, uh, we had, we produced up to 70 billion cubic meters in 70s. Now we produce uh, three times less, up to 20 billion cubic meters. And the problem is, as actually you described, that reserves are exhausted. At the same time, the government declared that, yes, as we want to be energy independent, as we were so much dependent on Russian gas, we have to focus on, on increasing of gas production in Ukraine. And this is a challenge, of course, for the country, for the government, and for the people. Um, so, I would say um, we as a Publish What You Pay coalition, as NGOs here, are talking about four main challenges which we meet and will meet when we will uh, discuss the future uh, reserves and actually fossil fuels and exactly uh, gas production. One is, um, as we uh, will uh, work with exhausted fields, uh, new technologies will be used. Actually, the shale gas, I think, production will will be used. fracking all these issues, uh, and which means that we will have to look much more closer to technologies, how they are used, whether they are safe, and uh, if we are talking about publish what you pay and NGOs control on this, we have to understand actually we have to understand these technologies. We have to understand what does it mean to use fracking what might be the threats, and how to control them. And here, actually, it would be very, very useful to have uh, any uh, example countries 
coalitions and NGOs, how they have this no got this knowledge and how they use these possibilities to monitor properly and assess uh, new technologies which companies and government will use. The second challenge is actually negotiations. You are right, uh, Ukraine, as, as many other countries, is going to negotiate with new companies uh, to invite them to extract, produce uh, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, here uh, I have to say that the capacity of the government and capacity of local people is not so high. So we will have to negotiate with the companies who has who have much more experience in, in negotiating. So uh, here, uh, I would say the, the really good issue on international level also uh, and on, on national level should be to have so-called model uh, positions of for NGOs, for coalitions and for governments to be able to negotiate. We know that there are a lot of model contracts which companies use for themselves and like, share among, among themselves but not so many, let's say, international model practices for government and for uh, uh, NGOs and uh, CSOs. The third challenge is, uh, is how to ensure that local communities actually will benefit from this production. I have to say that Ukraine have made some good steps. Two years ago, uh, our parliament adopted a law which uh, demands decentralized the rent uh, for regions, so we have 5% from rent payments, uh, which will stay in the regions. This happens from this year. And we do see some already good examples that local communities started to think how to use this money to, to develop the region, uh, to uh, increase the level of environmental protection, let's say, social protection. Uh, the issue is how to help them to use this money, not just to spend, you know, just to not, not for short term, but for long term development. And uh, again, this is a very good um, help might be to get knowledge about these resource corridors and, and other issues which, which we uh, can share this knowledge with, with local people. And the fourth challenge is, uh, of course, how to use money from, from extractive of, of uh, fossil fuels and minerals for the future generation. Um, Actually, Dermot already said about funds, which, for example, Norway has established, and, and this is actually a successful case for, for the, all the world. In Ukraine, we do not have such fund, and, uh, but we had some tries to develop draft legislation to create such funds. Um, but I have to say, this is a really challenging issue for, for I think, not only for Ukraine, because uh, we have to understand how to establish the structure, the fund, which will be used transparently, which will not be used for some other purposes than really money for future generation, and will not be used for corruption. And here this uh, protection, I would say, marks would be, uh, development of such protection marks would be really useful. I also want to say that we as a coalition are working hard to increase transparency in the sector, we uh, have the draft law on called actually on transparency in extractive sector adopted in the first reading several weeks ago and uh, as as of now the draft law demands open contracts the draft law re demands uh, beneficial ownership opening uh, and the draft law also demands uh, project by project reporting but we'll see how we will fight uh, and whether we will be successful in the voting in the second reading, because we do feel quite a serious uh, resistance from, 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 from the parliament side. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Oliena. Just a, a, a quick follow-up question. Um, you said that it'd be helpful to have model positions, including for civil society organizations, in the context of negotiations with uh, government and, and companies. So going back to what uh, Damid suggested in his paper that it could be helpful for Publish What You Pay coalitions to have a set of, um, of criteria or position on which type of extractive projects could, could, could be acceptable to civil society organizations and which ones 
um, wouldn't, based, for instance, on the extent to which communities are supportive of the project or the extent to which uh, it will have environmental impacts. So do you think that would be helpful in the Ukrainian context to have such a kind of national position among civil society organizations on what type of extractive projects are deemed acceptable and which ones aren't? Yes, definitely. Actually, if we are talking about benchmarks, um, at least now, at least I now can can say about two issues. One is environmental protection, and the, the second is social protection issues. Uh, if uh, co local communities and if coalitions have a very clear benchmarks to use uh, to evaluate each project from those two perspectives, environmental protection and social protection, that would be much more helpful to evaluate to assess actually all. Uh, every project, uh, every agreement, and then negotiate with local communities whether these or that project should be supported from their side or not. Uh, I have to say that Ukraine is 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 um, is a good case because uh, in our in our situation, local communities are engaged in discussion the agreements uh, and. Uh, PSAs actually um, between the government and companies. So if we have such benchmarks and we can properly and easily communicate with local communities, uh, that would increase the uh, capacity of the community to discuss these draft agreements uh, at the very beginnings of this stage, actually, of negotiations. Great, thank you. So um, let's move to from Ukraine to Zambia. Um, so we have uh, Metuelo Musoni online from Publish What You Pay Zambia. And Zambia is current, currently exploring how to manage its vast coal resources, coal being one of the most polluting and, and climate inducing fossil fuels. So just to start it off, uh, Metuelo, can you, can you share with us uh, what and if Publish What You Pay Zambia has a position on specifically coal mining? Well, thank you very much. I think um, for the coalition here, the talk about coal has been something that has been mentioned a lot over the past uh, few months, basically because of the enactment of what we're calling our seventh national development plan. So among us, the benchmarks in our seventh national development plan, which is running from the year 2017 to 2021, is looking at coal as a strategic resource to meet our power deficit. Currently, Zambia has a power deficit of 600 megawatts, and this is uh, being looked at as met through um, the coal that we have in abundance and the uranium through some sort of nuclear power plants. So if you look at the history of coal mining before now, um, Zambia has been mining coal from 1967, and basically this resource has been um, exported and has been consumed, um, a few percent of the resource has been consumed domestically by the mines in running their plants. But it's only now that we are expected to see Zambia actually mining more of coal because we're trying to use it as a strategic resource for electricity production. I think um, um, for five minutes or so, I had gone offline. It's basically because I had lost uh, my internet connection because I didn't have electricity. So you can imagine to say, this is a conversation that we're having in Zambia of using coal. But coming to as a collision, as a collision, I think we've always looked at coal as one of the minerals or one of the uh, minerals that would um, end up um, restricting us or uh, restricting our ability to attain sustainable development. So in light of the sustainable development goals, as a collision, we are probably thinking that we should not go into increasing the amount of coal that we're extracting, but we should consider if we need to extract coal, um, recycling it from old tailings because from the studies that have been shown around, coal has been one of the notorious resources that has been causing acid mine drainages in some of the old coal mines. We can even see flames um, 
uh, in there. So we're looking at probably trying to recycle the resource, trying to recycle old tailings from the core to extract new core as a way of not only meeting our power deficits, but also mitigating the environmental impacts of um, um, uh, old tailings uh, from the south edge there. Um, in addition to this, I think the conversation here has also been around preaching alternative sources of energy such as solar, such as biodigesters to basically slow down on the amount of coal that we desire as a nation to meet our power deficit. So it's basically been revolving around two things. If we're going to extract, let's try to first extract from the old tailings, let's try to extract and recycle the coal that has already been moved out of the ground. And if um, in a case that we insist to say we're going to extract, let's try to um, try to evaluate the alternative sources of energy. If the alternative sources of energy are good enough, then we do not need to increase our appetite for this resource um, as we move towards, of course, the sustainability agenda. Yeah, so that's for Zambia. So, Mitsualo, just uh, um, if you could, so do you think that coal mining is, is a viable scenario to ensure the, the, the kind of long-term sustainability and, and equitable development of Zambia? I hear your, you know, the concerns of, of people around electricity generation and the like thereof on one hand, and then on the other hand, the potential of, of coal, in, at least in the short to medium to medium term. But is so is there a conversation in, in Zambia about, you know, what, what you know, a, a kind of, um, that there's one question in, in the, in, from one of the participants in the chat box about promoting a, a, um, um, a managed decline of fossil fuel extraction. Is that a conversation that's happening in Zambia at the moment? Well, you, you wouldn't rightly say that it's a conversation that's happening in Zambia because um, we're talking about extracting more of this resource for domestic use. So us as CSOs are now bringing in the perspective to say, if we're going to meet our development agenda as a nation, we need to be very cautious of the environment. It's not only about us looking about long-term economic growth that's going to come with the increased electricity supply, ease of doing business. We actually look up, look, look, have to look at the environmental impacts that would come with increasing an appetite of such a resource. So for us, it's not a sustainable source of energy. It's not sustainable to mine coal, though the argument then would be from the resources that we're going to mine coal, we're going to diversify our economy, invest in other sectors, and also support other sectors that are going to be forward and backward linkages. But for us, it's not sustainable seeing that coal has been over the years been notorious in terms of environmental degradation and also been notorious in terms of um, um, uh, fueling climate change over the years. So we have had this conversation to say, if the nation is going to go forward and make mention that this is a strategic resource, we do not have energy, let's consider recycling the old tailings. The old tailings are the ones that are notorious for acid mine drainages that are contaminating underground water. So for the nation, they need to first work on recycling the old tailings, extract the coal that remained from the old tailing so as to meet two things. First of all, meet the power deficit and also reduce the environmental impacts that come with abandoned mines and so on and so forth. So that's what we're looking at. Once we do that, that's when we can have a conversation to say, we cannot go into investing in bigger power plants that's going to be dependent on this non-renewable energy source. Let's look at alternatives such as coal, such as biodigesters and other renewable energy sources that might come into play. And that's our position as a collision. Yeah. So one last question for you, Metrello, before I, 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 I go to Lebanon and Diana. One last question for our coalition in Zambia. In, in the background paper, there is um, a, a suggestion that maybe some published UPA national coalitions could have you know, positions on, on new extraction, for instance, of, of highly polluting resources such as coal, 
um, that that Publish Right Pay Coalition you know, could have a position saying that um, those new extractive projects of coal should not be allowed. Do you think that's a position that the Publish Right to Pay Coalition in Zambia, for instance, would be ready to, to take publicly, or is that too difficult in the national context? Well, I think for our coalition, we would be willing to take up such a position, basically because we have been interacting with the scope of extractives over the years. But if we go down to local communities where information asymmetry is so apparent, I think they'll be very reluctant to support us on this claim. Because for them, they'll look at it to say, why are these people who are said to speak for us now saying we're not going to have electricity being generated from this resource that we have abandoned? So it comes back to us basically transmitting or sharing with the local communities to say there are lots of environmental impacts that come with this. If we extract this resource, it's non-renewable and we're not going to have it in future. So we can basically preach alternative uh, sources of energy. And like I said, this is a position that our collision would be able to take. And for us, we look at it in the sense that if we are able to recycle and reuse old tailings and get something that can be of use for us, it will be of benefit for us and local communities in the sense that it would reduce the environmental impact at the same time deal with all this pollution that comes from the coal resource. So I think it's some, some space that we'll be thinking around. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Mitualo. So th there are um, a number of questions in the, in the chat box. We are looking at them. I just um, ask the, the two um, remaining respondents to, to intervene before we, we go on to the, the questions in the chat box, but please continue to, to ask your questions in writing. Uh, we will address them. So we're moving from Zambia to Lebanon um, with um, Diana Casey, the executive director of Logi, a published right UPA member in Lebanon. Um, so Lebanon is on, on the verge of, of, of starting to exploit its vast offshore oil reserves um, with uh, potentially uh, large-scale environmental impacts. Um, yet Publish Right UPA Lebanon is, is, is supportive of oil exploitation and, and believes it can be beneficial to the economy and, and people in Lebanon. So Diana, can you take us through your, your rationale or, or Logi's rationale that oil exploitation is, is, is worth it. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you and hello to everybody who's listening. Um, let me start by saying that Lebanon is, at a, is a very unique case as usual. Uh, we're starting when everybody uh, has already started for some time. Um, we just uh, got some, you know, for the past eight years, we have tried to develop the framework or the structure whereby we believe that such a sector can develop. Um, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, the, I, can't, I can't really say that this is the position of Logi, the, uh, the, uh, or, or Publish What You Pay uh, Lebanon around uh, the benefits of extraction. Let me, let me try to paint a very clear picture, and I would like to go back to what Diarmid said. Uh, Diarmid, the truth is that civil society is never ever consulted whether you are going to start extraction or not, whether this sector uh, uh, should start or not. Um, for Lebanon, in, in the, for the case of Lebanon, we woke up one day and we found that the state has taken the decision to extract. No free prior informed consent, no consultation, no strategy, nothing. There was um, a few good seismic surveys, 3D and 2D, that showed that we had uh, the potential or some possibly good estimates to find oil and gas. And uh, uh, this, uh, these studies came to a country that has $80 billion in debt. Uh, we have a lot of economic problems. We are about, I think, personally to declare uh, a bankruptcy at all levels. We don't have any of the sectors that are uh, working. Uh, we rate 143 on the corruption index, perception of corruption index. So the way that the government saw this or the way that the sector has been presented by the government to the 
uh, to the people is that it's the it's the long awaited messiah it's the it's what we have all been waiting for um, uh, and it's going to save Lebanon. So no real consultation was done. We just started. We got some very good help from the Norwegians. And um, we suddenly wake up to 2017 after so much political deadlock with a government that intends to put the, uh, the uh, oil and gas sector as paramount. And uh, they are running about signing contracts um, that basically allows companies to start extraction uh, or exploration in 2018. So that's that's the scenario. Of course, all of this happening uh, in the midst of a lot of geopolitical strife that is not at all unfamiliar to the East Mediterranean um, uh, context. Um, that's the situation. Now, the way that Logi has approached this is in a very pragmatic manner. Uh, instead of trying to push back, because it is a fait accompli, it's something that has already been done, the decrees, the laws have been passed, uh, the companies have been awarded, well, we went about saying, well, okay, where do we pick up on the conversation? What's the best realistic thing to do? And we saw that there is one a study that has been actually done and it might help civil society get up to speed or elevate or leverage the conversation that it might have with the government. And that, that, that tool that was laying there since 2013 done by the government but not uh, explored by civil society or understood was the strategic environmental assessment. Now for those who are not really familiar with the, with the um, terminology, the SEA, the strategic environmental assessment is a study that is uh, a requirement by most governments that, that most governments need to do prior to engaging in any exploration after they take the decision to explore. Now the purpose of this uh, strategic environmental assessment or tool is to do exactly what you're talking about now, is to evaluate the economic benefits or the impact, the environmental and social and economic uh, impact of any exploration that is going to happen in a country. So this was done by Lebanon, but all 800 pages was not really uh, reviewed by the by the um, by civil society. So we asked for for the government to publish it. They did, and then we got a consultant to review all these recommendations that were there. Besides discovering that this uh, tool or this assessment that was done by the government was far from complete, a lot of gaps were there. We discovered uh, that the that this study actually does talk about a lot of the. Um, uh, economic uh, uh, or environmental impact that we will have uh, and the economic impact that we are going to have because of this exploration that will start at the beginning offshore of Lebanon. We're talking about um, impact on historical ruins because of the drilling that is going to happen. We know Lebanon is a very rich country when it comes to historical ruins. It has a lot of the Roman uh, monuments. Uh, we also, we as a country, live off practically the only remaining, the remaining sector that is functioning, it's tourism. And tourism usually happens and is happening on the offshore of Lebanon, on the, on the shores of Lebanon. And these are the places that will be impacted by any exploration that is going to happen. So all of these are there. Um, the study does go all, all of them, not in a very comprehensible uh, way, but uh, here we are with these recommendations recommendations and the first thing that we are now doing and we are as Logi part now of a 13 member uh, coalition that was launched last week just trying to demand that we sit with the government and then some sort of public consultation happens prior to exploring okay and prior to this all of this happening um, again it's a very unique case that is happening in Lebanon I do not feel very comfortable when uh, when I position Logi as supporting the exploration. Actually, Logi and the, the coalition is dealing with a matter of fact. We're trying to salvage what is happening by demanding that we are part of the conversation. So far, we are not. I just want to also bring into the conversation two facts that we are also struggling with. First one is that we don't have any strategic uh, 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 
uh, and a strategy for the sector. So the government has just jumped into a very debatable sector without any national strategy. So this is something that we are also demanding. This is a fight that we are having at one level. We don't have any public consultation. This is something, this is another matter that we are also struggling to have because we know once we do have public consultation that we will be able to have our say when it comes to how we are going to extract when and all the and all the precautions we need to be part in. Uh, we just discovered also that we have an oil spill contingency plan uh, speaking about environment that will enable civil society to partake effectively in case of oil spill contingency uh, of oil spills and that are very prone to happen when um, a drilling starts in the offshore of Lebanon. Um, we need to be part of this conversation. So far, community-based organizations, municipalities are side-margined, are sidelined uh, by the government. Uh, another fact that we need to take into consideration here, uh, not to, you know, uh, to nag, is that we are also going to start onshore drilling. And um, again, uh, we have, uh, according to our constitution, all that is under the ground, our natural resources, are, uh, are owned by the state. So this gives the state the right for land acquisition. And again, we are not part of the conversation. The laws are being put in place. We are not being part of the conversation. So, Diarmid, the, 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 the fact is that civil society usually, at least in the case of Lebanon and many other countries that I know, are never part of the conversation or the decision to extract. That's a fact that we deal with. with. And how do we deal with now? Um, we've tried advocacy. We've tried uh, going to the streets. None of this is really actually helping. What we're doing, doing now is working closely with decision makers to try to impact positively the laws or the draft laws that are being shaped and put in place. So we will be able to have to be part of this conversation. This is how we are, uh, we are, uh, we are starting. One last thing I need to add before I leave the floor for, um, I know so hopefully so many questions, is that also as Logi, we are uh, dealing with the COP22 uh, 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 commitments that Lebanon has done, and it's basically that by 2020, Lebanon will be depending on renewable energy. 12% of its energy will be from renewable energy. So we are also posing this question to the government saying, so how do you propose to include this commitment that you have when you are developing the sector, what's your strategy for that? We know that all what we have, or what might have, again, this is nothing here is, is certain, uh, is, is finite. And we would like, because Lebanon is, is such a fragile situation where we don't want to pin all our hopes on this sector. We want to see how, how the Lebanese government is mitigating all these so many uncertainties and at the same time, time commitments that we have towards uh, towards the, the renewable energy and uh, COP. So I would just want to put all of these into context to see that uh, we're in a fix. I'm happy that this conversation is happening. We are reaching out to publish what you pay to see how can we really be empowered and um, uh, have the support to play our role effectively in a country that has just started or is about to start exploring and exploiting its natural resources. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. And let me just ask you another follow-up question uh, before I move on to Raoul. Um, last but not least, uh, Raoul from the Goa Foundation. Diana, I, I wanted to ask you a question that um, was um, put forward by Lily Fur from the Henrik Boll Foundation. Um, she's asking whether um, we shouldn't ask governments and companies to disclose to their citizens the climate risk of each oil or, or gas project. So the, the, the financial risk associated with the extraction of oil in light of climate change, in, in, in light of um, the, the limiting, limited carbon budgets um, uh, available, um, and, and, and the growing kind of carbon bubble and potential, potential financial risk associated with, with um, uh, carbon assets that may not be able to be exploited in light of um, global um, regulations limiting um, uh, CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. So is there a conversation like this in Lebanon around uh, the, the climate risk associated with these new oil projects? 
Thank you so much. That's a very spot on question. While there is a little conversation happening around the climate risks, there are two uh, um, assessments that are, are required, uh, but not uh, necessarily asked to be published, and it's the environmental impact assessment, and that's the, the study or the assessment that is required by all companies to run on, uh, where, uh, on the extraction area. So um, we have awarded block four and nine for exploration for a consortium uh, of, uh, of companies, Total A&I and, and Novatec, and, we, and by law they are required to run an environmental impact assessment that will tackle this issue. But the law, and this is what we are now uh, strongly advocating for does not require the government to publish these EIAs, the Environmental Impact Assessment. Now, when we are approaching the government, asking them to publish them, the response that we get is, why do you need EIAs? Why do you need health, health safety and environment plans, uh, exploration plans to be published? You as civil society have little knowledge about it. You don't have the capacity to understand it. So why should we bother with publishing them? And that's the kind of rhetoric that is actually happening in Lebanon. Now, while we should not be at a position to uh, um, explain or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, uh, say why the, uh, the government needs to be transparent, we also at one point need to prove that we have the ability to, ex to understand these impact assessments. And again, going back to the conversations my colleagues had earlier, we need as Publish What You Pay members to build our capacities around these issues. We cannot keep on asking for information to be released without enabling ourselves to understand these, this, this information to be able to negotiate, to be able to carry a um, fruitful conversation. We need to also build our own capacities around these issues. Great, thank you so much, Diana. Um, so moving on to Rahul from the Goa Foundation, a, a relatively new member of Babish White Upe in India. Um, India, so India is, is the world's third uh, largest coal producer. Um, I understand that is, it is set to double its coal production in the coming uh, three years, and the Goa Foundation is opposed uh, to these trends. So, Raul, can you tell us why? Um, you have a slightly different uh, analysis uh, from many of the other publisher UPE members we've heard today. Thanks, Elena. Uh, thanks, Eliza, and. Uh... Thanks for giving us the op giving me the opportunity to explain how we are looking at uh, minerals. As you mentioned, uh, there's, there's actually been a large debate over the last 10, 15 years, really, about uh, the nature of minerals and what we're supposed to do with them. And I think uh, Goa Foundation is now reaching some sort of a conclusion, which is reaching some acceptability across uh, both civil society and government. And let me just lay out uh, uh, a little bit of the big picture on this. The first thing is that in India, by and large, uh, minerals are owned by some level of government, offshore minerals by the national government, states or subnationals own most of the subsoil minerals, but there are pockets where there are indigenous people who own uh, sort of in collective the minerals. But from that, we've actually derived a couple of other principles which have come from our legal system, but probably applies anywhere around the world, and which is basically the idea that natural resources, including minerals, are inherited. Uh, none of us have created a forest, or you know, maybe we have, but most of us haven't created the forest or the minerals. And in general, the obligation when you inherit something is to make sure that as presentation, use it, but pass it on intact to the next generation to also benefit from it. And it should carry you, carry on through generations. Uh, this is essentially the idea of something called intergenerational equity, which has become a pretty large topic in the environment movement, but uh, extends well beyond that. Now, how does this apply to minerals as we see it? So the first thing we're saying is that basically minerals are assets. So what we're doing in the process of mining is selling the mineral. We're selling our asset. 
So let, let me take an example that we use to make people understand this uh, issue clearly. Think about inheriting a piece of jewelry. Uh, or it may be in some context, a family farm or the family gold, the family silver, but we all have metaphors for this. If you inherit some something from your parents, it's classically the obligation to make sure that your children receive the same inheritance. So it might be, let's say, a pair of gold earrings that you've inherited. Now, there are two things you can do with the gold earrings. One is you can put it away, keep it as gold earrings and your children, or if you don't have children, your nephews and nieces, you receive those gold earrings and you've met your duty to make sure that what you have inherited is passed on. Or you can say that, you know, gold earrings, you know, if I have to keep somebody from stealing it, it's a hassle, or I need to, you know, get somebody to protect it, which is an expense. So let me sell this and buy some land. And as long as I keep the land properly, the land will give me some income. My child will get the land, they will get income, and it can pass on through generations, every generation getting income in their turn. Now, if you say the same thing, if you look at the minerals and mining in the same fashion, what we are arguing is that uh, minerals basically are depleting. You know, once you've extracted it, they're finished. So the process of mining is nothing but the sale of our minerals over a period of time. Now, when we sell our gold jewelry, what do we do? We basically make sure that we get the absolute best price. You know, there's some cost for the jeweler or for checking out the value, but we want to make sure every single uh, the bit of the value is received by us. And if there's some massive tax imposed by the government on this, Tale of gold jewelry, we say, okay, well, let's not sell it, we'll keep the gold as is. Uh, so in the same way, we say that we feel that the key criteria while mining is not maximizing revenue, but actually making sure that there is no loss. And this is a very important sort of a psychological aspect. Uh, the conversation currently globally is that royalty and other money coming from minerals is revenue, or it might be called income or earnings or taxes. Now, all these terms basically mean that if you get more revenue, your GDP grows, you can you have more money available to the government to spend, or it might go to local governments and they can spend. But essentially, in all of these cases, what we are doing fundamentally is taking our inherited asset, selling it, getting money, and spending it, which effectively means our children are not going to receive their inheritance. And this, this whole thing is driving an overconsumption kind of a system. The other thing that something revenue is driving is that uh, when you look to maximize revenue, it's a very different standard from no loss. Because when you maximize revenue, you're not sure if there's an absolute target of how much revenue we should ideally get. There's no way to compare it with something else. But when you say that there should be no loss, then it's very clear sort of a bright line standard. If there is a loss, there is a problem. And what is the problem with the loss? The problem with the loss is that who's making the benefit? Who's gaining from the loss? It's classically the extractive companies who in turn are bribing in many cases the politicians and the people expected to look out for our interests. So we had the situation in Goa where we discovered that of our iron ore, iron ore is the big mineral in Goa, over an eight year period when we were extracting minerals worth 100, and I'm talking about worth 100 after expenses and all, you know, sort of reasonable profit, the state government was getting less than five. And 95 was... Now, what, and why was 95 going to the miners? Because essentially, they were in turn being able to control the politics in Goa, and the politicians in turn got so much money from the miners that they were being able to get re-elected and have a continuous cycle of uh, controlling the whole system. Now, 
the consequences are when a miner has a contract to get something worth 100 for five, it is obviously illegitimate. As a result, what they do is they go in and extract as quickly as possible, and anybody in that part becomes sort of anti-national or anti-development or anti-many other things, and the full force of the law comes against them. And then you have all your armed conflict, civil war, all of that. So this is what we've been seeing. Essentially, what is happening globally is this idea that when we get natural resources and we extract it and sell it, the moment we call it revenue, we're basically on this treadmill of extract more and more, and everybody is fighting for a share of that money. And the loser are our children and future generations. Who's fighting? It could be the government, it could be the mining company, it could be the local community, it could be the police in some places, it could be the army in certain cases, and including civil society who are saying that, you know, let us put it into education or development or various kinds of things. Even, even the idea of putting money into development is, uh, in our perspective, slightly fraught with danger because what we see, for instance, in India is that when they say development, it means that they might you know, take the money and build a very posh school in the capital, but the persons in the mining areas are left without power or any kind of supplies. But the original natural resources are owned by everybody equally, absolutely in common, but when the money is taken and used in these kinds of fashions, it gets into a very uh, sort of unfair kind of a distribution with certain powerful people making most of the value. And uh, if I can just conclude, I feel that uh, this is a problem that civil society globally are contributing to. Uh, EITI, if you look at their sort of standards, they constantly talk about revenue as well as uh, taxes. I can just uh, quote, we recognize the benefits of resource extraction occur as revenue streams over many years and can be price dependent. Our point is this is not revenue. Publish what you pay's mission, for instance, is uh, United. we are all united for a call so that oil, gas, and mining revenues improve the lives of women, men, and youth in those rich countries. Again, the word revenue implies that it is income, but fundamentally it is not. If you're telling your family goal, it's not income. And this is a, a, a fundamental issue. How we're looking at this whole thing is basically saying that if we are selling a family goal, we must make sure that we retain the full value of the asset, put it into a new asset, and that new asset, if it earns any income, because the mineral belongs to everybody, the new asset belongs to everybody, the income belongs to everybody, we are asking for the income to be distributed equally to everybody as owners. So what we're specifically asking for is zero loss in the point of extraction. Every single bit of value which is received by the government must be put only into a sovereign wealth fund because any other form of putting the money away gets unbalanced. And lastly, any income after inflation should only be distributed as a citizen's dividend. And we feel that this is the only way to ensure that our future generations receive the value of the mineral, as well as uh, ensuring that many of these uh, resource curse issues that we see are not uh, prevalent. Linked to that, because minerals also impact the environment and human rights, we're also in, in asking for FPIC, as well as limits on the amount of extraction from environment, uh, on environment grounds, as well as making sure minerals are available for future generations. So let me stop here, but this is the broad uh, sort of perspective we are taking on mine. Thank you, Sean, Thank you so much, Raul, um, for this really interesting perspective, which, as I said, is, is um, um, not necessarily shared by all Publish Right UK members, but I think this question around intergenerational equity resonates with all of us. And Mitualo, you had a question in, in, the, in the chat box for Rahul around this issue of intergenerational equity. 
Could you please um, ask Rahul directly what your question is about around the use of, of money as, as capital or the use of, of those natural resources as, as, as um, you know, kind of the, the family goal and the capital of the country that, rather than an, an income? As, I thought your question was really interesting. Uh, so my question to Rahu was basically in the context of sustainable development goals and um, seeing that for the sustainable development goals to be achieved, we need to look at not compromising the ability of future generations to also meet their aspirations. That being said, if we're going to look at um, extracting resources and probably saving in form of a sovereign wealth fund, does it mean that future generations will inherit the money from the sovereign wealth fund and will have no minerals to make use of? So in the context of India, which is looking at increasing coal production, does it mean we are going to increase pro coal production to the extent that we deplete the coal resource, use it for electricity, and because it's non-renewable, we have to look for future renewable. <laughs> energy sources or other energy sources, while at the same time, time we have a future generation is going to have all this burden of electricity for the core but instead of the core they now have the money for it so it's around that score. do we need to look at um reducing the amount of minerals we're consuming or do we need to look at increasing the amount of money we make available for our future generations yeah um, that, that's a really good question and uh, so in the framework we're using we're saying that minerals or extraction is associated with multiple values. One value is the ability to use the mineral, which is what you're referring to. There's another value which is related to the, uh, the income from the work of extraction. You know, from the sort of in Goa, there's this big debate about, you know, there's a lot of people who are employed in, you know, driving trucks up and down. And that's also sort of a value which we go away once the mineral is exhausted. There's the environment which is uh, also damaged. And of course, there is the money value. So what we are asking for, and we, we are actually proposing this in Goa for iron ore, but it applies equally to coal, is saying that we can only extract one by 200th of the reserves each year, which will ensure that we don't extract everything immediately, but over at least seven generations. This is sort of a second best solution to intergenerate. But it's something that we can argue for today that we have no right to exhaust everything, that our children itself cannot get anything. So that, uh, but in a similar way, we are also asking for caps on, uh, on environment. We're asking for no-go areas actually, and then for the remaining amounts, caps also from, extra, from an environment damage grounds and these two caps would be independent caps. Uh, does that answer your question? If, if I'm getting you right, you're looking at a hybrid of two concepts. The first concept is limiting extraction, so you can ensure that future generations can also extract and use the resource for their own use or future use. And at the same time, you're looking at keeping some of the revenues for the future generations as well. Are we looking we're at doing, both or doing one of the two? No, we're saying we're doing both. We're saying that we have this massive amount of, let's say, inherited gold. We're selling a little bit, but whatever we receive from selling that, it's not revenue. We're selling our asset. So every single bit of money we get from selling this has to be put into the sovereign wealth fund. We have no right to spend any of it. It has to be saved. Now, in turn, the sovereign wealth fund will invest. So it's not that the money is not being used. Because how will it generate income if it's not invested? But, you know, it has to be kept aside in a very ring-fenced manner like Norway does and many other actually countries do, like Botswana, Timor-Leste, Alaska, many examples of that. And then the second bit is, because we all own the mineral, I saw this question online, since we all own the mineral, we all own this sovereign wealth fund which has been created from the mineral, and we all own the income from the sovereign wealth fund. 
So like Alaska, Alaska is a great example of this. We're saying just distribute the income equally to everybody as a right of ownership. And if everybody in the country gets some gets this amount from mining, they will all be concerned about are we getting the best deal? Are we doing things properly? And in a related way, if I can just expand on this, where it comes to transparency, what we are saying is that basically if you look at mineral as this massive amount of wealth, and we look at the history of what happens with massive amounts of wealth, basically everybody is trying to go and steal the money from this. You know, and you look at movies of all kinds, you know, you have an Indiana Jones or Artheist and various ways people try to steal the money. The classical way that people steal a huge amount of wealth is that the person responsible for safeguarding it, which is our politicians and bureaucrats, they go in and take away the wealth. So from that, we have made a demand for radical transparency. We are saying that the only way that I, as an individual, can make sure that I meet my obligations to my children and future generations is I know at any point in time and I can verify that nobody has stolen from me. So we are asking for absolute radical transparency. Nothing can be hidden. Every single transaction, if there is a truck moving, we should be able to tell what is on the truck at any point in time, where is the truck, who has bought the mineral, who has sold it, what is the value, everything. Thank you, Rahul. I really like that concept of radical transparency. Um, we unfortunately we're coming to the end of the webinar. We just have like ten more minutes, um, and and I've asked Darmi to uh, to kind of recap the conversation. But there's still one question that was asked um, in the chat box that I'd like to to put to all of you from Jeff Gapel from Mining Shared Value in Canada, um, and he asked whether published right you pay should not move towards um, a position that's kind of centered around mining rather than um, oil and, and gas and, 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 and coal. Uh, and he says, publisher at UPE should never appear to be boosting the oil and gas side of things due to climate change. So maybe a question for Diana, <laughs> a country that's preparing itself to be a major oil uh, producer. Um, what, what do you think of that proposition? Well, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a proposition that is quite ideal, but I don't see this uh, actually happening. Um, again, I want to always bring the conversation down, down to, uh, to the ground. Um, Publish What You Pay as a movement is a very, is a movement that has grown out of real needs, real facts. Uh, not to not to say that what he is asking um, is not uh, important, but the matter of the fact is that there is oil and gas exploration. It is happening everywhere, as well as mining. It is affecting, and um, civil society is still trying to find how it can position ourselves to our their, themselves to be part not just part of the conversation to try to change and to be more effective in minimizing all the impacts, whether it's on the economy, whether it's on the climate, on all actions. I don't see if, uh, uh, you know, turning Publish What You Pay's campaign into a, 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 a climate against, you know, against climate change um, movement, how this is really going to happen to help all civil society and all the asks and all the um, demands that we have when it comes to really benefiting from the natural resources. Uh, in our case in Lebanon, uh, we don't, it's not mining, it's oil and gas exploration. And um, by the way, I just saw a question regarding the exploration production agreements and they are published, the model contracts are published and they do have uh, articles regarding, uh, the person was asking about whether they have articles regarding environment and they do have articles regarding the environment uh, in the sense that they demand that impact environmental assessments should be done uh, by the companies, but in no place do you see that they are asked to publish these uh, uh, EIAs, environmental impact assessments. So that's my two cents. If I, if I may jump here, Alex? Yes, go ahead. So the first, uh, just a comment to the end, to the end. Uh, I, I would actually propose uh, to use uh, directives, EU directives on 
strategic environmental impact uh, is, um, impact assessment and environmental is impact assessment. You will find there actually all main elements which then you might demand from, from your government, including transparency and publication. And also talking about actually uh, whether extract or not, I will try again to share my screen. Please confirm or not whether you see this picture. Uh, do you see this picture? No. We don't know. We're not seeing it. Sorry. Sorry again. So I just uh, tried to use, um, I, I took the data from uh, International Energy Agency. What will be the demand in 2015 of different fossil fuels? And I have to say that if we are talking about oil and gas, which will still be in demand, but not so, they, the demand will not grow so much, but it, there will be some demand. And a rapid increase of coal, the demand of coal. So we have to take this, I would say external factors into account and negotiate actually inside of us. Um, if we cannot influence uh, to decrease consumption or demand of some fossil fuel fuels for the next 20 years, what should we do with this? And if we can see that the demand will decrease rapidly, how we can help local communities to move from this, using this fossil fuels to some other sources like renewables in Africa, I think this is really very, very prominent and, 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 and good choice. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Oliana. So we have about five minutes left. Uh, let me turn to Diamid again to um, share a few, a few uh, final concluding remarks, if, if that's all right. And apologies, we haven't been able to address all the really interesting questions in, in the chat, but um, we will look at them and find a way to um, provide answers uh, to, to all of them, maybe in, in, in the blog that we'll be um, publishing after this, uh, this conversation. Uh, Diamid, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Okay, so just to, re to recap, um, the, uh, the two questions I raised at the beginning were, should all the oil, gas and minerals in a country be extracted? And if not, what should be the criteria that you use to decide that question? The second one is what should publish what you pay's position be about what governments should do now to prepare for a future with less or no extraction in it. Now, interesting, what I hear from the comments that these are issues that, that, that a lot of people are grappling with. Um, sometimes in quite different situations, you have Lebanon where you're just coming into this field, or you have, uh, say, countries like Ukraine and Zambia where there's been a lot of extraction for a long time, and it's about how, how to get a bit more value out of what's, out of what's there. Um, one common theme that I do hear in all of this is the um, this 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 problem of short-termism and of, of of governments not being participatory or providing information in the way that these decisions are made. So that a lot of these decisions about not just about individual projects but about the sector are made on a very short-term basis, as we know, sometimes for for, for corrupt reasons, sometimes for other reasons. Uh, and that there's a, there seems to be a, a general problem, which is different in each country of, of, of the extent of knowledge and participation uh, in, in, in those like, key strategic um, decisions. So that suggests to me, going back to my original theme, that there probably is a way in your new strategy that you can look forward and take some of what you're currently doing, which is transparency, accountability, but a proper consultation of local communities and so on, and, and work that into a position which looks at the future of extraction as well as what it's doing at the moment. And that covers all the questions from should we extract to um, what are we going to do in 30 years' time when we can't sell our coal anymore? Might be less than that, of course. So I think I think it's been a very interesting discussion, very useful, very fascinating for me to hear it. And I think there's there's there's, there's a lot of scope to to come up with a position. It may may maybe a two-level position. It may be that you have certain certain international themes, as I suggested, and then maybe you have more specific positions in each country. But it definitely seems that orienting the questions that you're asking towards the future and the question of what does it mean to extract or not to extract, what does it mean for people and society and the environment, seems to me a very fruitful way to keep, to keep the coalition looking forward and relevant. And of course, the other thing is that having an international position in this area then should help 
nationally in countries where it's a little bit difficult perhaps to have people saying at the international level no this is this is what you should be doing our government these are the kinds of questions these are the people you, you should be talking to this is what you should be publishing so very very fruitful and I, I wish you all the best of luck I think it's going to be a fascinating fascinating and very fruitful conversation great thank you so much David for oh, recapping the conversation uh, unfortunately hi Faith <laughs> Unfortunately, we're finishing uh, the, the webinar just now. <laughs> um, so we only have like two minutes left. But um, I encourage all of you to uh, continue the conversation on the Publish What You Pay email lists. Uh, we will be uh, circulating the link of this recorded webinar. Um, and we'll have a, a web page where we will announce also upcoming webinars on other issues such as taxation and the extractive sector. Uh, that's going to be one, one strain of conversation. And then another strain of conversation is going to be around community rights and extraction. Uh, so thank you so much, Dami. Thank you so much to all our respondents, uh, Mitualo, Diana. Oliena and Rahul for your time and your ideas. Um, we had, I think, at the um, most, I think, 43 participants at some stage. So thank you all so, so much for all of you who joined. I think this was a, a, a really inspiring conversation to be continued. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank bye. you and bye. Thank you. Bye.